I've never to this day ever met one guy or woman in the wrestling business that has the passion that Roger still has today. You know, the Northern Wrestling Federation is going on with 20 some years old.
question it is, Roger, are you man enough to get in the ring with me in Fairfield? Do you still got it, Roger? August 31st, 1964. It's right here in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was raised in a little suburb of Deer Park, Ohio. Uh, my parents were Ross and Ruth Bachman. Wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, my mother was uh, an accountant at a national chain hotel. Uh, and my father owned a glassware business where they sold plates and dishes and uh, beer mugs and all kinds of different stuff like that. My parents were just absolutely wonderful people. His parents were great. 
Ruth and Ross, they support him, they spoiled him. He was the youngest of the kids. So, yeah, anything he wanted, he got. Growing up, I, I think I was a pretty good kid. I really was. I was, uh, I don't want to sit here and say I was popular, but I, uh, yeah, I was popular. He was very, very popular in school. Uh, he got along with everybody, it didn't matter if you're popular, if you weren't popular, he just got along with everybody. Um, I really didn't get in any trouble. I knew where that fine line was. I come right up to it and I stopped. But overall, you know, I think I didn't get my parents no trouble. And he actually had hamsters hidden in his closet thinking that his parents would not know which was interesting. I was like, they have to know you have hamsters in your closet. Growing up, I just, you know, I was into just your normal everyday stuff. Sports and chasing girls and just good fun stuff like that. We had bas I, I was on the basketball team and we didn't have cheerleaders, so Roger led the cheers at the basketball games. It was awesome. I first discovered that I was interested in wrestling. All the neighborhood kids would go down to the Cincinnati Gardens and they ran wrestling shows there every other Tuesday night. And the whole group of us would always go. There could be 10 or 15 of us because the neighborhood that I grew up in, tons and tons of kids. And you know, we start, I started going down there when I was probably five or six years old. And I enjoyed it, yelling, screaming, hollering, I enjoyed it. But I, the, I remember very distinctively when I knew that this is something I wanted to do. It was a night at the Cincinnati Gardens, and it was a grudge match that I was just waiting to see. It was Tony Marino against Killer Brooks. And Killer Brooks, long hair and beard, and he always smoked a big cigar on the way to the ring. And he's coming down the ring, and he's hooting and hollering, and me and all my friends and my brother was with us. They're all hooting and hollering at him. And Killer Brooks takes that cigar out, and flicks it on the ground. My brother looked at me and I looked at him and we took off for that cigar and my brother got that cigar before I did. And I was so upset. And I said, I will show him one day. It was all because of Killer Brooks' cigars why I'm in wrestling. You know, when I, when I first decided that I wanted to be, to get into wrestling, you know, I was really young and no one really paid too much attention to it. But the older I get and I didn't drop the idea, I continued on, you know, saying that's what I really wanted to do. Yeah, you know, my friends kind of, eh, some of them liked wrestling, some of them didn't. They didn't really pay too much attention to me uh, as far as that goes. But my mom and dad were very supportive, you know, if that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, they were, they were behind me 100%. Then I found out that he did this wrestling thing and he, he actually did it in his backyard which was interesting because I really didn't watch wrestling at all. I've never admitted to this. Well, I've admitted to it a couple times, but yes, I did backyard wrestling. I did a lot of backyard wrestling. I didn't do it to the extent that uh, the craze well, a few years ago, backyard wrestling, but we did a lot of backyard wrestling, yeah. We, the funny thing about it is we actually really tried to wrestle. Uh, today's day, the kids are back there beating each other up with light tubes and all that kind of stuff. But back in my day, we actually tried to wrestle. I'm sure we didn't do it very good, but we sure tried. But yeah, of course, I was the champ, of course. And it was my promotion, of course. Remember? Bull Bachman was my backyard name. Bull Bachman, I used to wear the t-shirt that said, you mess with the horns and you'll get the bull. Well, first, as far as like uh, getting involved in pro wrestling, the first uh, thing I did was I started doing some odd jobs. Well, it, when the promotion would come to the Cincinnati Gardens, I was the first one there. I was the first one waiting in line. I was ready to get in with my ticket. I was probably the only person that bought my ticket a month ahead of time. And I uh, would be the first one there. And I'd be the last one to leave the building. The ring would be tore down and the last car would be out a lot and I would finally leave. And uh, the local promoter at the time, Les Ruffin, uh, he noticed that. He noticed me there every show, 
noticed me being the first one there, and noticed me being the last one to leave. And finally, he had inquired I was interested in wrestling and stuff. And uh, he said, "Well, you know, you're too young to wrestle, but you know, there's some stuff you can do around here to help us, and you know, to learn to learn the sport." And I jumped right in there. The first thing I started doing was putting up posters. And you know, this is. 1977, 1978. So at that particular time, wrestling was down, was way down. So they uh, they didn't come to town a lot, but and when they did, I knew I was at least at that particular time in my life, I knew that well, man, there's not really a lot of people here. So when he said, "Well, you want to help us put up some posters?" I said, "Man, if I want these guys to keep coming, we need to have bigger crowds." Because I always asked him. Uh, is this a good crowd or is this not a good crowd? And he would always tell me, and I, so I kind of picked up on that. So I started putting up posters and flyers and stuff. I, me and my friend, I remember one time, me and my friend, he was driving at the time. I wasn't driving yet. And we had put posters all over his car, all over the windows, all over up and down the side of the car. And we would just drive around town real slow. My first actual job on the show was ring attendant, uh, and where I got to walk right down to the ring, right next to the ring and take jackets. Uh, the ring jackets the guys would wear to the ring and stuff, and that was big. I mean, that was big time. I thought, oh, I made it. I, uh, I basically owed my, my thanks to Les Ruffin, who uh, helped me get into the business. And you gotta realize when I got into professional wrestling, it's not like today where anybody and their brother could get into wrestling. You uh, you had to know somebody or you had to uh, really, really pay your dues and uh, you know just take that extra step forward to get into the business because it was a very closed knit group. But uh, Les Ruffin got me into the business and uh, well, I was taught the old fashioned you know, back then there wasn't a lot of wrestling schools, so I didn't have options for actual physical training, but I was trained mentally. And the, the, I think the best thing about, about it was the mental part of my training that was first was the etiquette and was the, uh, the respect part of the business. That's why I'm so big on that. Uh, I didn't learn nothing about the insides of wrestling or the moves or anything until I learned to respect the business. That was the very first thing that I learned. I lived and breathed wrestling, and there's a lot of people, you know, that say that, and some people do, some people don't, but I truly lived and breathed it. And even though I might not have knew how to execute the moves and stuff 100% properly, I had some type of a, an idea because I was so grossly obsessed with it. And um, my first match that I ever had was the first time that I ever locked up with somebody in the ring. It called up, uh, just Jim Connolly called me up and said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, got a kid here uh, wants to wants to work on uh, wants to work on the show for us, you know. I said, uh, well, where uh, where did you work before? And he said, uh, he hasn't worked anywhere. And I said, well, no. I said, well, tell him, you know, tell the little sob that. Uh, you know, he's not booked. And he said, well, he said he would, he would work for free. I said, well, tell him that he's booked then, you know. My first first wrestling match, I like to always lead into this by saying it was a cold, dreary night as the rain slowly sprinkled down on the windshield of the car. As I drove down 27 through Kentucky to Falmouth, Kentucky on Saturday night, November the 5th, 1983 was my very first match. And I, you know, and the funny thing about it was I had been in a dressing room before dropping off jackets and stuff like that, but I never really had spent a lot of time at one sitting in the dressing room. So my heart was pounding. I had no clue what to expect. And I think I was, think I was the first one there that day too. 
and the last one to leave. But uh, November the 5th, 1983, I wrestled a a gentleman by the name of Bobby J. Never laid eyes on him until I got in the ring. It was the first time I'd ever seen him. And I couldn't tell you, I thought, I really got a lot of, you know, I was really, it was congratulated after match. You did great, you did great, you did great. But I couldn't tell you if it was any good or not. I'm sure it wasn't. But, uh, you know, it was good enough that they called me and told me to come back. With it being my first match, not knowing if I was going to do any good or not, I uh, did not tell nobody. The only person that knew I was having my first match was Les Ruffin, who got me booked on the show, and a buddy of mine who went down with me. I didn't tell my mom or my dad. I told my mother when I was walking out the door. I said, don't tell dad. The reason being is because I didn't know if I was going to do any good or not. And I didn't, I knew they would come. And if I did bad, I didn't want them to see it. And I remember when I got home, my dad was sitting on that kitchen table. You son of a bitch! Why didn't you tell me? And it was the funniest thing in the world. But I remember I didn't tell him and he he never let me live that down. Early on, I was very fortunate. You know, Les Ruffin was very good to me. Uh, He was a real pain in the ass but he was really good to me uh, and he got me in. He got me in a few doors. You know, he was getting he was getting quite older at the time, so he didn't have as much pool as he did at one time, but he still had enough. I was, he opened a couple doors for me, and one was I got to wrestle for the WWA out of Indianapolis, which was run by Dick the Bruiser, world famous Dick the Bruiser. His opponent from Cincinnati, Ohio, 218, Roger Ruffin, Ruffin. And uh, that was the first, I would say, quality wrestling show that I got to be on and I didn't deserve to be on those shows. I wasn't good enough for that but just because of less I was able to get on that but I learned so much because there, there was a lot of older veterans on those shows that uh, taught you a lot so I was very fortunate to be on that. I got to wrestle in front of big crowds and uh, that's very humbling. It was, it was a good time. His opponent from Cincinnati, Ohio at 218, Roger Ruffin. that were on those cars too, Bobo Brazil. You know, I grew up watching Bobo Brazil in the Cincinnati Gardens, and then I got to wrestling. I mean, that was like, that would be like uh, the younger guys growing up watching Hulk Hogan getting to wrestle Hulk Hogan, it was the same thing. I mean, it was getting getting a step in the ring with him, and what a true gentleman, what a true gentleman. Um, wrestled against him, I tagged with him, and uh, I'll never forget that, that was great. Botech Jr. from Miller Beer and Miller Lite is joining us today, and the Kansas Outlaws have really exploded on the scene here. Oh, they truly have two of the toughest men in the WWA Superstar stable, and uh, I think they're going all the way to the top. And a combined weight of 516 pounds from Lansing, Kansas, the Kansas Outlaws. I first met Sam Cody, my lifelong dear friend. Uh, actually, he was the promoter of the f- my very first match. 
First time I seen him in the ring, it's the first time. I, I knew this kid had really something special, really something special. He had a true talent uh, for the sport and uh, for the business. Yeah, if everyone knows Sam, but if you, have, if you don't know him and you see him for the first time, you think, ooh, this is one mean son of a bitch. And that's partially true. He had a little bit of a temper back then, but I, that was when I met him all the way back in 1983. And you know, shortly after that, we became best friends and we've been uh, dear, close friends ever since then. You go up and down the roads a lot, you know, and uh, you'd work a lot as tag team partners and you'd work uh, some nights, you know, uh, against each other, you know, up and down the, up and down the road. And uh, we, we uh, created a, a hell of a bond together. You know. uh, you've never been on a road trip until you've been with Sam Cody. And I'd like to say that I consider myself, I wouldn't say a partier, but I've partied a little bit of my time, but you've never partied until you partied with Sam Cody. And we made it home every show, and that's a miracle. That is a miracle that we made it home every show. Well, uh, one, of, one of my uh, favorites is, uh, uh, I was, uh, I was rest, wrestling as a Russian, uh, and he was wrestling as a patriot uh, at the time. And uh, we was going to Michigan, and we was wrestling in those, uh, ice arenas up there, and uh, they all look alike up there. We've been up there uh, so many times. I have been up there more times than him, so he was depending on me to find the building. In Dearborn, Michigan, I believe it was. And I said, we pulled up to the building, and I said, there it is, and we seen a, uh, I seen a uh, parking lot full of cars, and I, I just figured there's the, the wrestling match. I said, we was running late anyway. I said, run in and tell the promoter we're here. He put his mask on the Patriot and grabbed his bag, went running in to tell him we was there. And I pulled up, parked the truck, and I was waiting. And uh, he come out cussing me. It was uh, a gun and knife show of what was going on. Now, can you imagine, I mean, he uh, uh, went running in, into this gun and knife show with a hood on and, uh, and a bag, you know. They, first thing they thought, you know, this guy's coming in to rob the place, you know. I actually, uh, I actually first started tagging with Sam. Uh, I've known him for quite a long time and been up and down the road with him for a long time before we actually started tagging. He had went to... Uh, he had got booked out in Kansas uh, for uh, Central City, or excuse me, Central States Wrestling. Uh, Bob Geigel ran the territory and Rip Rogers was booking. And he went out there to be uh, Bobby Jagger's partner. Now, Bobby Jaggers was originally teaming with Dutch Mantell and they were called the Kansas Jayhawks. Well, when Mantell had left the area, they were bringing in Sam. And they wanted to keep the same, the same, uh, gimmick on them, but they want to just change the names a little bit. And Sam was a little bit wilder and stuff. They said, well, we're going to call them the Kansas Outlaws. Well, shortly, real shortly after Sam uh, went out there, uh, Jaggers had got a great offer to go to Puerto Rico. And that's when Sam just jammed my, my name down Rip Rogers' throat. Bring in Roger Ruffin, bring in Roger Ruffin, bring in Roger Ruffin. And, uh, and we had tagged a few times before that, but nothing serious. But then when I went out there and tagged with him, and we stayed at Kansas Outlaws from there on out. Uh, we wrestled in Peru, Indiana against Ricky Steamboat and of some partner. I don't recall the gentleman's name, but uh, it was Steamboat fresh off his WWE run. So he was hot. He was really, I was right before he, uh, I guess he was going to WCW then or wherever it was going, but was right before that, he was really hot then. And uh, that chopping was just the most popular thing at that time. And uh, I remember me and Sam saying, yeah, we'll go with him, we'll go with him. We went with him, but boy, oh boy, he could hit you. 
he could hit you. But I remember that, that's one of the, you know, one of the more notable matches I remember. Me and Sam, uh, we thought, well, okay, we got we got booked by Jarrett's, which was USWA, or they've had different names in the past, but they were one of the last remaining territory uh, promotions still still doing somewhat decent business. So we had uh, done our best to get in there, so we got booked. It wasn't even for TV, it was for a house show in uh, Lexington, Rump Arena. And, you know, if I recall right, there was five, six thousand people there, which for a big arena like that wasn't great, but for us, man, we were like jacked. We were jacked, so it was uh, me and a guy I'll mention later on, and Sam, again, Sam Cody and Ron Sexton. And we just nailed the match, just nailed it. It was a great match until the very, very ending. And something went terribly wrong. <laughs> And uh, Sam almost went to jail that night. And Kenny McGuire was running the ropes toward the end of the match. Nobody was in his way. Nobody was anywhere near him, and he fell down. He just fell down. And they told us if they needed us again, they would call us. They didn't call us again. And I can remember out in the parking lot leaving Rump Arena and I can remember Psycho Sam, me standing in between Kenny McGuire and Psycho Sam, and Kenny McGuire said, Sam, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Sam said, you son of a bitch, I'm gonna kill you! I'm gonna kill you! Kenny McGuire, the worst wrestler in the world. You know, I talk about <clears throat> tag, tag team with Sam, but I actually wrestled him a lot more than I tagged with him. I mean, the first, Oh gosh, five or six years of my career, I wrestled him every weekend. I mean, it didn't matter what promotion. I mean, we had literally had people calling us for that match. People wanted that match. Uh, at the time, uh, Sam was wrestling as a Russian, Igor Zatkov. And I was wrestling under the mass as a Patriot. And that was, uh, you know, that, that was at a time where the, where, you know, Patriots were really coming up, and it was USA, USA, USA. So it was an easy match. It was an easy match. Uh, Psychology-wise, it was an easy match. Physically, it was not an easy match. Uh, we would beat the tar out of one another. I mean beat the tar out of one another. We wrestled at a fair one night, and I'm, there wasn't nobody there. There was maybe, I don't know, 50 or 60 people there, and we wrestled at this fair, and it was drizzling out. But that didn't make no difference to us. You know, I mean, any wrestler knows you don't go by how many people are out there. You go, especially guys who really truly love the business. And I can remember that night we fought to the top of this grandstand. I don't know, 30, 40, 50 rows up into this grandstand in front of 50 people. And I can remember him saying, let's take a bump all the way down. And we did. We got to the top of that thing. And I remember me hitting him and him hitting me and down we went. And we took a bump down these 50 flights or 50 rows of chairs. And I'm telling you, we didn't stop once. It was kaboom, 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 all the way down there. And I remember landing at the bottom. He said, damn, that was cool. Let's do it again. And I said, no way. Uh, and I, we did a lot of, back at that same time, we were doing a lot of shows for uh, Midwest Wrestling out of, out of Columbus area. And we did a lot, they did a lot of fundraisers in the schools. And the schools always drew real well. And that Russian USA was easy in the schools. Man, it, those kids would just go crazy. And we had a lot of great matches going off that USA stuff. That was a, that was a fun time. That was really a fun time. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that immensely. Uh, Cause we were having great matches. Uh, you, when, we are, when you know you're, who you're wrestling and you're confident with who you're in the ring with, you have great matches. And we had some great matches together. You know, just it clicked. Uh, Al Snow was starting off at the same time. And Al Snow's a great wrestler. But when we wrestled, I wrestled him some single matches and Sam wrestled him some single matches and we did some tags with him too, but we never clicked. <laughs> they weren't very good matches. I, re I remember they weren't very good matches. Um, we did a lot of gimmick matches back then too, a lot of chain matches and stretcher matches. I really enjoyed having some stretcher matches. That's why I still like to like to have those on our shows because those can be really emotional. I, I always like doing those matches. 
There's nobody that I would rather wrestle against, and there's nobody that I would rather tag team up with Sam Cody, because you always knew whether it was going to be a good match or whether it was going to be a bad match, it was going to be balls to the walls. It's always good to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, doing the local shows around the Cincinnati area, I got to meet Bob Harmon, who's uh, very um, underrated in his knowledge of the world of professional wrestling. I learned so much from him. But uh, I started wrestling in November of 83, and that was when all the big cable boom was getting ready to start, or it kind of started, but the big explosion was getting ready to happen. and. Uh, that's when the WWF, I still refer to them as the Federation, the Federation was going to come to Cincinnati in Jan it was, I think it was January or February of 84. And I had just started wrestling recently, you know, at a, just a few months before that. But uh, Cincinnati always had a wrestling commission. And they had certain rules and regulations that if a promotion came into Cincinnati, they had to follow these rules. And one of them was that they had to use a commission referee. Well, at the time, there had been wrestling around for a couple years in Cincinnati, and they didn't have a commission referee, so they needed a commission referee. Right place, right time. So I was very fortunate there. And I started refereeing right there in Cincinnati, at the gardens. And at that time, Cincinnati was the only town that they were running in this area. But I don't know if it was three, four, five, six months later, they started running Dayton and Columbus and Lexington and Louisville and all those towns. Well, they didn't want to fly all these referees in uh, so they started needing local referees that they could just have drive there so uh, another being in the right place at the right time so I started getting booked in all these you know towns within you know 100 200 miles of Cincinnati and uh, I was a good referee I always I always tell people I was just an okay wrestler but I was a good referee and uh, you you couldn't help but be good around those people because those people, that's where I learned the wrestling business is by refereeing. Because you're dealing with the wrestlers uh, in the ring, you're watching how the crowd reacts, and then you also have a boss in the back who's very knowledgeable, and you're learning from him. They were really good about as soon as you walk back through the curtain, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this right, continue to do this, so on and so forth. And it was just such a learning experience. I got to work with greats. I'm not talking about in the ring, I'm talking about as far as the guys in the back run the show. Uh, Chief J. Strongbow, just, and Pat Patterson, these guys are just so smart. And it's a shame, I'm not saying that the people that are running the business now aren't, because uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit withdrawn from that, but uh, these guys were just so knowledgeable, the little itty bitty things that you do. And uh, I also worked for George Steele, Grizzly Smith, Rene Goulet, Tony Gurria. These were legends in the business, and these were guys that were really, really respected. And uh, that's how I learned, I really learned the business, by, by just listening. Les Ruffin always told me, just shut up and keep your ears open. And that's what I did, and I learned a lot doing that. I, I remember the I, re, I remember the first uh, night that I refereed. I can't tell you what matches they had there, but uh, I remember Bob Backlund was still the champion. So uh, it had to have been early January then, because I believe he lost the title sometime late January that year. So it must have been early January of '84. But he, uh, I remember him being on the card, and I remember George Steele being on the card. That's all I really remember about the car. And I remember that they had their ropes were ropes. Back then they actually used big, huge, thick rope rather than a cable like they use today. So uh, I just remember, I remember that ropes would bend real far out before the guy shot back into the room. Oh, I remember being extremely nervous. I remember, do I sit here over in the corner 
Do I ask what I'm doing? Do I ask what match I have? Or do I wait for them to come to me? Oh, I remember being petrified, hands sweating. I was afraid to shake anybody's hand because they were going to say, what's, you know, and I was always petrified, petrified. You know, when I, when I was refereeing for the Federation, um, I still had a full-time job. And they would run, they were running a heavy schedule at that time. They were running three nights a week, or three shows a night, excuse me, three shows a night. They had an A team, a B team, and a C team. So, I mean, they're, you know, they're, uh, they have 20 shows a week. So, and they ran around the Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia area a lot. So I got a fair amount of, <clears throat> of work out of them. But, you know, I still needed, I just had a family, and I still needed a regular job at the time. And, uh, I would, uh, it was a early, early, early morning job. So I s could still make all the shows. But I can remember driving to Youngstown, Ohio, five hours, get off work, drive five hours to Youngstown, referee, drive straight back into work the following day and work all day long and head out of town again. It was, uh, I hated it then, but I would do it all over again. I was fortunate enough to wrestle for the Federation a couple different times. Uh, they weren't very long matches. I was fortunate enough to wrestle against the Junkyard Dog in Columbus, Ohio one night. And I like to tell people it was about a minute and 30 seconds, but it was probably closer to 30 seconds. But, you know, a couple more years from now, it'll be a five minute match. But it was, uh, it was easy, but it was great, man, because he was over so huge at that time and just, uh, you know, feeling that sensation when you're in the ring and people just scream was just awesome. You know, I had a few other matches. No, and I never did TV form. It was always house shows. Plane was late, so and so couldn't make it. This that, you know, and it was good to you know they liked that to know that I could wrestle and referee both. So you know, I was using a few emergencies and it was good. Some of some of the guys uh, that I remember refereeing with, there was there was a lot of them that I really liked and a lot of them that I didn't really care for. And um, you gotta remember that when I first started refereeing with for the Federation, that was at the time of the explosion. And these guys were making some serious jack. And um, a lot of the older guys, um, I off the top made Greg Valentine was so easy to deal with. And I mean, there's many, many others, like I mentioned before, George Steele and, and uh, Black Jack Lons and all those guys. Those guys were so easy to deal with because they had they've been there before and they had made money before. So they were, you know, they, they took it serious, but you know, it wasn't, they, well, they didn't have these big inflated heads. And some of the younger guys who were coming up at that time had not made money before. And now they're making serious money and they got these big heads. Now these are the guys, these are guys that, that don't get me wrong, these guys probably became very humble after a while. And these guys uh, <clears throat> probably uh, are saying, said the same thing about the, the next generation that came up, because they, they always do that. But I remember the younger guys, uh, Shawn Michaels was a jerk, a jerk. Uh, Marty Jannetty was a jerk. All those younger guys, and don't get me wrong, they're tremendous wrestlers, and, and I'm sure eventually they, you know, they uh, learn the right way. But some of those guys were jerks because they never made money before, you know. And all of a sudden, you're making thousands of dollars a night. So, uh, but I, I always, if I would look, I would look at the wall and see the card and see uh, Ruffin next to like Greg Valentine versus somebody. I was like, yeah. And then I, or I'd look and see. The rockers against somebody, I was like, because oh, they were tough to deal with. The worst match I ever refereed, I remember the worst match I ever refereed very clearly. It was at the Survivor Series. It was, I don't know if it was five guys against five guys or four guys, but, and all the wrestlers that were in the match, I would call them that they were the world's greatest wrestlers, but they weren't bad. But that night it did not click. It did not go well, and uh, I was—they were yelling in my earphone the, from the TV crew in the back, and the, they were running down the ringside yelling at me, "Get this match over! End this match! Get this match over!" And it was—we couldn't. They just couldn't get it together. It was—I and I don't even remember what uh, Survivor Series it was. It was one of 
you know, one of the early ones, but it was not good. I'm sitting, uh, I'm sitting at my dinner table eating dinner, and the phone rings, and it's Terry Garvin on the phone. Now, Terry Garvin at the time was in charge of the referees in the, in the ring, scheduling all the referees out. And I can't even remember how close it was to WrestleMania. It was, it was close. It was only a week or two away. And he called, and I answered the phone. And he said, Roger, this is Terry Garvin from the Federation. I said, hello, sir, how are you? And he said, listen, he said, I don't mean to bother you. He said, and I don't know what your schedule is, but uh, could you be in Indianapolis for WrestleMania? And I'm wanting to say to him, are you fucking crazy? Of course I can be there, should I leave now? Uh, he said, my secretary will call you, she'll give you all the arrangements. And a, a quick thing on that is she just, she called me and she said, go to this hotel, your name's there, you're registered to go, just be there. I think I had to be there a day early. Go in a day early and uh, I didn't have to be anywhere, just go in and we wanna make sure everybody's in town. So I show up at the hotel and I walk in there and I say, I'm Roger Ruffin, I'm here with the WWF and of course, no room. So I'm thinking, ah! I, well, I was gonna sleep in my car no matter what, I wasn't going home. But uh, fortunately enough, she said, well, we have a couple WWE rooms that haven't been taken yet and I just showed them my credentials and I was in, so that was good to, that was good to know and then I was off to WrestleMania, which was quite the experience. I was so nervous that night in that hotel sleeping before the show, I couldn't sleep. And I went down to the bar and uh, that was when UC was in the final four. I remember that because I remember watching UC lose in the final four. I was a big, I'm a big UC fan. And they lost in the final four. Does that added in on my nerves? I think I got drunk that night too. But, uh, then the next day was WrestleMania and it was an all day affair. And there were so many people there and they put on the biggest spread in the world and it was uh, quite the experience. If you've ever been around a TV production, uh, at, on a wrestling TV production or whether, you know, any other TV production or if you haven't been around one, there is nothing like it as far as the commotion. There is so much commotion. And WWE, they always do things up big. Well, at WrestleMania, they really do it up big. And there's, there's just hundreds of people working behind the scenes that you, know, you don't really realize. And they're running all around and everybody's yelling and screaming and, and it was just quite the atmosphere. But they treat you like gold. They really treated me, you know, it was, it was quite the experience. And it was, uh, it was very nervous, you know, it was very nervous because you don't know what you're doing, you know. Of course, the wrestlers are all informed about what's going on when they're wrestling, what, where they're at in the card stuff, but, you know, they don't have to tell the referee immediately. So you're waiting around, you don't know, you know, it's, you don't know to go, if you should go ask or you just wait and stuff like that, but I figured here I am, part-time referee, I'm figuring, I mean, every match on WrestleMania is a big match, don't get me wrong. But I figured, well, I'm gonna do one of the first couple matches or something like that, and I'll be done for the day. And once I finally did get my assignments, I had gotten uh, Shawn Michaels and Tito Santana. And Tito was getting a little bit older at the time, so he was, you know, he was helping enhance the, the younger talent. But that was when Michaels would do it. It's when Michaels had first you know, turned on Marty Jannetty and he was about to get a huge push. So that was, you know, that was a big, you know, even though it was the opening match, that was a big match because that was when they were getting ready to really, you know, launch him strong. So I was really happy to get that match. And then I'd gotten uh, Rick Martel and Tatanka. And Martel was, you know, he was one of their one of their bigger heels at the time. Uh, so, and I'd worked with him a lot of times. And I, you know, I'd, I'd said he was one of the older veterans that was very easy to deal with and very respectful. So I, I had refereed him many times before and I was happy to get that. But the shock came is when I found out that I'd gotten Roddy Piper and Bret Hart. And that was, that was not the main event that day, but that was damn near right up there and that was a match they had pushed really, really, really hard. So it was an honor that I was even even thought of for that match, let alone to get assigned that match. And uh, 
because those are two legends that, you know, that, that will go down in history of always being one of the top guys. So, uh, and it was, uh, it was quite intense. I remember uh, Piper clocking Bret Hart at one time when, when uh, Bret Hart's shoe or shoelace had come out of his boot. And Bret had went down to fix his shoelace on Piper and nailed him. Blood was everywhere. And I'm a fan of blood. So it was like, yeah, here we go. Hope some splashes on me. <laughs> I know the announcers chewed me up, chewed me up on commentary for that, but they did for everybody, so that didn't bother me. But I know all my friends and family, man, the, the announcers think you're terrible. So, well, I guess I was doing my job then. Getting in that ring was just something else. You know, I, I don't usually, usually I get nervous before things, and once it starts, I'm all right. But, uh, the show's getting ready to start, and I'm in the first match. So I figured I'm getting ready to go down there as soon as they get done with the National Anthem, we'll know. Reba McIntyre was singing the National Anthem, and I was always a big fan of hers. Love Reba McIntyre, I like redheads. I like all girls. But uh, she's standing there, and the agent, girl, actually Girl Monsoon, looks at me and says, okay, you walk Reba down to the ring. <sighs> and it was like a football field to the ring. So I offer her my arm and she grabs a hold of me. And she's a real little bitty girl. And uh, that 100 yard walk was, I was trembling. I don't know if I was more nervous because of the 60,000 people there or because of WrestleMania or because Reba McIntyre was on my arm. And uh, I walked her down in the ring and she got up into the ring and she sang the national anthem. And that was probably, next to my daughter being born, that was probably the most nervous I ever was in my life because she's singing that song and I'm looking around at that crowd and it's just an ocean of people. My dad had already passed away. I had got the most awesome feeling came over me that he was watching me. So I, I uh, refereed for the Federation from 1984 until the late 1990s, 15 years, something like that. and. Uh, it was quite the experience. I learned a lot, and uh, well, you know, kind of what I miss about that is um, I miss the old guys. I miss those agents uh, because I learned so much from them. I miss. Uh, I just miss the respect factor. Uh, I'm not there now, and I and I'm not saying that they that's not going on there. They could be they could be totally wrong, but when I watch it, I don't see that. Maybe I'm watching something different, but it's a different day and it's a different time. We all wish we could turn the clock back, but uh, it was uh, it was an experience I'll never forget. I thank those guys 